Hello and welcome to another episode of Literary Gladiators, the show where we discuss and debate literature in all of its forms. If it's written work, it's game. Let's meet the panel. I'm Larry. Hi, I'm Jesse. I'm Ellie. And I'm Josh. And uh, we're about uh, halfway through your stay, and uh, are you enjoying yourself? Yeah, it's been good. <laughs> Alrighty, that's great to hear. Uh, you enjoying uh, the uh, Ellie uh, episodes? Yeah, I have been. I love her. <laughs> <laughs> got lots of fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just so sad that I have to work the rest of the week. I don't get to do all the fun stuff with you guys. It's very sad. There's always room for <laughs> the future. But, and you wanted to say something, Larry? No. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing nice to say about Ellie? It's fine. <laughs> No, Ellie's great. I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that you came and visited us. It was very touching and uh, makes me feel happy. Like you know, we're, like we're, yeah. we're reaching across the globe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's it's awesome. So cool. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly is. I really did. I skipped to my dad this morning. I was like, I'm not gonna be home for dinner because I'm having dinner with my book club friends and somebody from Australia. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Already, uh, we're going to be going over one of Ellie's other favorite writers that she always talks about on her channel, uh, Margaret Atwood. <laughs> Reminds me of Elf that you just did there. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like my favorite Christmas movie, so. <laughs> Elf? Yeah. yeah, I don't like Christmas, so I like that a yeah. Christmas movie is Same. like saying something, but. Maybe Elf, never, what's never... my favorite color? Or what's your favorite color? That's like... I pause for a second. Yours is Bad Santa? I like Bad Santa. <sighs> so, I'm, movie? I am so surprised by that. I like, I also so like, cynical. if you're, I, I like, I like Night of the Meek from the Twilight Zone, too. Oh, yeah. I, like, I, like, I, love, I, that one I do too, love, actually, um, A Christmas Story. Love and, oh, it's such a great Christmas story. Christmas story is overrated. Uh, yeah. Night, Nightmare Before Christmas. I like uh, yeah. the Griswolds that Christmas. Too. Uh, That's so I like the 1951 uh, Christmas Carol. It's, ridiculous. Yeah. it's a ridiculous movie. Tell me it's I'll have to check that one. <laughs> it's, it's a ridiculous movie. movie. I'm, That's why I love it. I'm glad none of you said Wonderful Life. Oh, God, no. Uh, That's a terrible movie. <laughs> I think what? they what? spend about 75% of the movie uh, with the bank closing. They spend 75% of Christmas on It's a Wonderful Life. Let's get yeah. real here. Already. Okay, that's my second favorite, so you guys shut up. <laughs> what? We're digressing. Moving on, moving on, moving on. Okay, we're sorry. Going Get over, back to what you guys talking about. We're going about. over uh, Lucis Nature uh, by Margaret Atwood. Uh, it's a short story from her Stone Mattress collection. Which when is, did that come out? Uh, it's more recent. Yeah. yeah. And Jesse, you have a discussion, sir? I do. So you know, I thought it was a very interesting read. I hope everybody else thought it was, too. Um, but I wrote down a quick question um, here that said, because as, as we read through, we saw that she had turned into a monster of some sort. Um, your interpretation can be whatever. But um, would you say that the story, aside from its monster element, is a metaphor for how we, as in people, um, perceive, react, and judge those different from us based on looks? I think a lot of it, uh, I think, yes, and I think a lot of it... Uh, uh, explores the history of us doing so and how back in the day uh, they did it in a much harsher tone uh, there's doing but it was a, a different kind of harsh because we still judge people harshly based off the of physical appearance but uh, the condition that she has is uh, porphyria which is also known as vampire disease. Oh, okay. I have so that. I it made her look more like uh, the perception I get is like an I am legend kind of vampire. See, the thing was, I that was what I was originally visualizing, but then she was talking about hair and whiskers. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I kind of moved away from the thought that maybe it was a disease that, like, made her look like a vampire. She had of. she had attraction to blood as well. Yeah. First it was they would give her uh, they would the feed her the chicken blood chicken, yeah. but then it uh, escalated into being coming attracted to uh, the male half of a particular couple. But yeah in the climax there. You yeah. gradually kind of go like you know she's killing chickens or whatever and drinking the blood first. And mm -hmm. That's her way of uh, surviving uh, but it, it but it's a uh, it seems it seems to be a bit of a, a supernatural element to that too because 
Uh, granted, porphyria is defined as a disorder resulting from buildup of certain chemicals related to red blood cell proteins. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with it, and I remember because uh, I, I used to watch a lot of documentaries around Halloween time that discussed like where the legend of the vampire came from, mm -hmm. um, and it came from that disease. I, I didn't remember that name, but I remembered it was a disease. Um, and so that's why I that's why I thought it was like oh the red fingernails the yellow eyes like this makes sense but then started talking about whiskers and hair and I was like wait is she a werewolf and then the cat was like I like you I was like did she get bit by a cat kind of like Spider Man got bit by a spider like <laughs> I'm a little confused yeah she's Catwoman just not in the same sense yeah. um, so no, I was a little I, confused I, I, I had that I, I always had that idea that it was uh, it was a disease that she developed yeah because they were talking about how she how she started changing like after she had the measles I think it was yeah. um, in the beginning so yeah. that's why I thought but then you know it, it just like you said a supernatural yeah. element kind of came about it and I was like okay I was and a bit thrown off the first time around too I thought it was, it was her uh, I thought she was telling the story alive and dead but then I read back and mm -hmm. uh, it was they they faked the funeral and so, they pretended yeah, to bury her but the, the way that they portrayed the priest was just too much for me <laughs> I love that I uh, the idea that uh, she's doing God's will, uh, and they paid him to say that. Yeah. The idea that, I quote, the uh, he told uh, he told me God had chosen me as a special girl, a sort of bride, you might say. He said I was called on to make sacrifices. He said my sufferings would purify my soul. He said I was lucky because I would say innocent, I would stay innocent all my life. No man would want to pollute me. Would want to pollute me, and then I would go straight to heaven. You're so ugly. No man wants you. But that's a good thing because <laughs> you're you God's bride. <laughs> like. And unfortunately, uh, in some way, shape, or form, these uh, instances like this were true. Yeah. yeah. The, the worst one was with the sister uh, saying how. Uh, no one's going to want to marry her because she, her sister's a freak. And the moment that they, the, uh, the person, the, the speaker, which is interesting, nobody has a name. Yeah. The yeah. speaker, the moment that the speaker's death is faked, uh, uh, the sister's married shortly thereafter. And everything's going fine and dandy. And she's also part of the mob of people that's looking to kill and I think that was like the, because, I mean, the rest of this, the whole story actually um, just seems like, you know, she stayed the same little girl, just she had all these changes and nobody listened to her because of, you know, she looked very scary and uh, she was a demon. Like her own mother tried to hold her head underwater. Like that's, that's like you're a kid and your head's being held underwater. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, no, just trying to get the demon out of you, honey. It's okay. And like, even, <laughs> the, even the, she was like, there was no ill will there. That's what the mom. grandmother okay. was saying, yeah. too. The mm -hmm. grandmother was also pretty harsh with the idea that uh, one one happy child's better than two miserable ones. Mm -hmm. like, but that's the and way the, And then work. even the yeah. fact that the child, that, that she was like, yeah, she's right. Like, yeah. that's yeah. really, like, that the child is just like, yeah, you know, it's just kind of better off that I'm dead so my sister can be happier because I'm a scary-looking person with a disease, like, yeah. or whatever it was that happened. And it had but, a lot of vampire, it, it had a lot of stereotypically, uh, stereotypical traits that are uh, applied to vampires with uh, not being able to... Uh, respond to the sun well. And I think the mom even, uh, they said that the mom put garlic outside her door or something. Grandmother did that. Grandmother, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Lara, you wanted to say something? No. <laughs> yeah, I've, got, <laughs> I've got something. Um, I read it as being kind of like a disability narrative, and it's sort of like a lot of those things were kind of happening at the same time to people that were disabled. Like, they were being mm -hmm. like, sent off to institutions and things like that so that because they were like the family's shame and the family's burden and the family could be happy if you know they weren't there and they didn't have to look after them and it wasn't such yeah. a a scandal it's very reflective of flowers for algernon with uh, i found the uh, similarities with uh, the whole idea of uh, sending uh people that were different in a, a, a way that provided some sense of burden to the common 
uh, individual or individuals, sending them away to an institution. You know. But I felt that this one was more like the Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka, where uh, the uh, central character became deformed and the family uh, started to see them and treat them as a burden. And uh, the speaker was locked away and uh, they would still feed her, uh, but it was more of a, a chore than it was uh, something that you uh, are willing to do. Yeah, I would agree with that. So, but, was there anything else uh, anybody wanted to say? There's not a whole lot to it, I don't think. It's not particularly profound. I didn't find it or deep or... I don't know what it's getting at exactly. I think that it has a lot to say about... Uh, I think that it has a lot to say about the way that we have historically uh, uh, judged people based off of... Based pe uh, judge people based off of differences that they could not help. And it's not like that person wants to be in that position, but yet we don't have the decency to give them the respect that they uh, need. And, and reminds us of a time where it was far worse. I think it was interesting, too, that the speaker was uh, with the was with the time where she wasn't the kind of speaker that was going to uh, revolt against her judgment. She was somebody that just de dealt with it. Yeah. But I think that's why I kind of like, I just felt really bad for her. I'm like, mm -hmm. Everybody's just I, leaving I, I and agree. you're just okay with it. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. it's, it's sad that she was, yeah. but I think she was speaking for that period of time. She didn't want that mentality of a more progressive thinker, but instead, what would someone in that position be thinking? Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and to her, it would, she was just looking forward to death, where uh, the, uh, I think the strongest line is, uh, in heaven I'll look like an angel, or the angels will look like me. But, Wouldn't that be a surprise, I think? Yeah. Okay, yeah, it was, uh, per, uh, perhaps in heaven I'll look like an angel, or perhaps the angels will look like me. What a surprise that will be for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, like, kind of uh, helped me kind of come up with the question, is that, you know, here everybody's judging her, and just because of how she looks, it's not, it has, it has nothing to do with who she is and, uh, you know, what she's like, because, again, clearly she... She stayed the same person, like she, or at least in my opinion, I felt like she stayed the same person. She just seemed like a gentle, understanding, very, she was a child. Yeah. And then she turned into a monster, physically, um, but all they saw was monster, kill it, as opposed to, oh, that was a little girl. Like We don't really her. know anything about her, mm -hmm. though. It's no, like, it no be, you don't. But it would I, be I, more effective if she had some kind of personality or something. I like, think that I in a way, though, that really... I think that in a way, not naming them uh, has uh, an impact of its own. Not, not even know. naming, just giving I her... I think she does have a little bit of a personality. Yeah, and they show it because, the, like, again, for going back to the grandmother saying that, you know, oh, you better have better to have one happy child than two miserable ones. And she just stood there and was like, yeah, you're right. It's like, just, that's like just a very selfless kind of mm -hmm. yeah, thing. Yeah, she's still very much a yeah, child. Yeah, they yeah. really understand. Selfless isn't much for personality, right? It's like... No, I think that can, I that think, can I mean, I think define something. If you don't have a self, right, then you don't have a personality. You're just like, what are you? But you're she could have just as easily sat at the table and said, no, like, I want to live. That like, would have been better. Me. That would have been something. That would have been something, but the fact that she didn't do that is also something. She allows herself to completely be uh, defined by circumstance. Which is still considered a personality. Because if you're not, then that's just like, I mean, it's like, do you speak Jesse's up or right. don't you? Yeah. Um, like if, so I if can't even think of another. Up, if yeah. you speak <laughs> up, you're either assertive or aggressive, depending on the execution. And if you don't, you're passive. Mm -hmm. 
So that's why, I, like, I, I still think, like, it shows some personality, like, whether it's that she doesn't understand yet or she's selfless and understands and just that knows that maybe her family is better off without her. Either way, like, she's a child and she's going through this terrible thing and mm -hmm. by the end of it, when they're all coming to her house with torches and pitchforks, she's still standing there like, well... The poor yeah. cat, whatever they do to me, they'll do to the cat. Which broke my heart because we all know how much I love cats. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, yeah. and that's that was, like, her immediate thought. Yeah. Like, it wasn't even like, oh, they're coming to kill me. Maybe I should run and hide. It was like, no, I'll just face it. And the poor cat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Ready then. Uh, anything else uh, you wanted to say? Final thoughts? No. Nope. Already. Uh, mm -hmm. I found this uh, online, by, or if you're interested in checking out uh, Lucis uh, Naturae by Margaret Atwood, you can find it in the Stone Mattresses uh, collection of short stories that she recently came out with. Uh, she's still very much uh, active with her writing and uh, has become very well uh, respected in the literary world. Or she has been well respected in the literary world. Uh, one of Canadian, uh, one of Canada's finest. Uh, but thank you for tuning in for another episode of Literary Gladiators. If you're interested in our material, I encourage you to like and subscribe. And if you have anything to say, feel free to say it in the comments. Be sure to join us next time for another episode of Literary Gladiators. For now, keep reading. <laughs>